sophisticated population that imports a significant amount of our own food. So uh, many of you are gonna be familiar with some of this data. I just wanna make sure that everybody's clear on it because uh, frequently when I teach my classes with undergraduate students, they're taken aback by some of the information that's now being published on global climate change. So uh, this is relatively recent information showing that in the uh, last few years, we have been achieving the highest temperatures globally um, that we have ever achieved and 2017 is on track to be the hottest year in recorded history. All of this, of course, has implications for the food and agricultural sector. We, we take a lot of data here on uh, climate change and atmospheric concentrations of CO2 and you see a clear increase in CO2 through time, which as CO2 is increasing in the Earth's upper atmosphere, that traps more uh, heat in the Earth's lower atmosphere, driving more severe weather events. And so a very clear trend line, increasing CO2 uh, that leads to increased uh, temperatures in the Earth's lower atmosphere. Let me go back um, here. As you see that we are, as of 2017, we're um, just achieving about a little over 400 parts million in the Earth's upper atmosphere of CO2. The problem with that is what is considered safe in the international climate community, what is consensus is um, arriving at is about 350 parts per million uh, concentration of CO2 in the Earth's upper atmosphere is what is considered to be the highest concentration of CO2 to maintain a stable climate. So we've exceeded the Earth's upper atmosphere concentration of CO2. So we are at about 400 and we need to decrease the amount of CO2 in the Earth's upper atmosphere in order to maintain a, cli a stable climate. So that means pulling CO2 out of the Earth's atmosphere. And that, that has important implications for agriculture as I'll get to as agriculture is one of the most significant contributors to greenhouse gas emissions among any sector. This is recent IPCC report uh, discussing what is anticipated in terms of trends in global warming over the next uh, next 50, 60 years. So at the current rate of emissions, we're going to hit two degrees Celsius of warming by 2030. That's the upper threshold that many climate scientists believe will um, keep the Earth's uh, climate system stable. Beyond two degrees Celsius of warming, we are entering uncharted territory in terms of stability of the climate on planet Earth. That's at current rates of emission. So within about 15 years, we're gonna hit the upper threshold of temperature that is gonna maintain a stable climate in the Earth's uh, climate system. At current rate of emissions, and this is uh, those of you who are following the Trump administration and the EPA head, uh, this is not good news because at current rates of emissions, we're, we're on track to hit four degrees Celsius of warming by the end of this century. And the IPCC has used language such as globally catastrophic if we reach those levels of warming. And this is, of course, two degrees and four degrees Celsius of warming. That's relative to the pre-industrial era when some of these temperatures begin to be taken. So we are on track to achieve the point of climate destabilization within 15 to 20 years, perhaps on the outside 30 years. So that has important implications for us because of the fact that severe weather can drive crop losses, crop losses drive food pricing, and food pricing drives food insecurity. And we already have a very high rates of food insecurity in the Hawaii population, particularly in the native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander population. This is data from NASA showing, uh, this is based on modeling, showing that at the current rate of emissions, by the end of this century, much of the continental United States, particularly where agriculture is being done, by the end of the century, there is a very high probability that there will be very long and severe droughts lasting between 10 and 30 years in many of our prime agricultural areas. So as a food import dependent uh, state, uh, whether or not climate change hits us directly, other parts of the world that we are reliant on for our agriculture 
are going to be impacted. And again, this is based on um, current rates of emissions. So uh, by the end of this century, high probability of very long-term droughts lasting 10 to 30 years. That will increase food prices dramatically if many of our agricultural areas are negatively impacted. So this is a recent review out of Science Magazine, just on a social science review looking at what are some of the impacts on social and economic systems as a result of extreme temperature. So you can see a couple of uh, important aspects of this is as temperature increases, even though agricultural crops can increase their productivity in higher concentrations of CO2, you reach a certain temperature threshold and then uh, productivity of agriculture begins to decline. Severe weather, uh, drought and flood negatively impacting crops, driving food prices, driving food insecurity. So again, as a highly food import dependent state in the context of climate change, and the eventual need to tax carbon, those two things are going to uh, intersect to drive high levels of food price volatility here in, in the state of Hawaii. That's, that's my uh, anticipation. Okay, so looking at this at a global level, we have globally been very uh, if, um, successful in increasing global agricultural output for quite some time. That's the upper trend line in this graph. So agriculture around the world has been increasing in its productivity for quite some time. Um, at the same time, we still see high rates of food insecurity, in, not only in the United States, but in many parts of the world. What is driving food insecurity? In addition to you know, civil conflict and so on and so forth, but one of the prime drivers is food prices. And as we see food prices fluctuating, then you see rates of food insecurity tra tracking along with food price. So this is a food price trend line and you see right around uh, the, the Great Recession, food prices went up significantly. Uh, that was directly the result of an increase in fossil fuel prices. And then you see the trend line in terms of global food insecurity. So what I'm speaking to here as, um, as an individual living in Hawaii uh, in collaboration with uh, the communities in Hawaii is I'm very concerned about global climate change negatively impacting global agriculture and are being entirely food import dependent. We really have no resiliency in our food and farming system. And so that's what I'm particularly concerned about and interested in collaborating with uh, some of you about how do we build, how do we first measure uh, resiliency in the food and agricultural sector, and then how do we begin collaborating to make our food and agricultural sector more resilient and equitable? So a couple other things and then I'll shut up. Okay, what does agriculture have to do with this? Um, agriculture is one of the greatest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions because of our very energy intensive form of agriculture that we now employ. So if you, if you add up, I, I see it on the right, I've written that agriculture contributes about 25 to as high as 35% of total global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if you look at the chart, it has agriculture at about 15%. That's only the production part. So if you add up the chemical fertilizers and the pest control, materials that go into agriculture, if you add up all of the contributing uh, sources of fossil energy that go into agriculture, that's how you get to uh, 25 to as high as 35 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Clearing of forest land for agriculture, all of those things are key drivers of greenhouse gas emissions, including how we manage farming systems. So as I mentioned, agriculture is an important driver. These are, this is a list of some of the key contributing factors to agriculture being such a high emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. So deforestation, animal agriculture is perhaps one of the largest. Many of us don't realize that, but our heavy meat diet, and especially a meat diet that's based on feeding animals corn and soybeans, there's a lot of embodied energy in the animal agricultural systems that we use today. Okay, this is a recent 
uh, study from the Food and Agricultural Organization showing about of that 25 to 35% of greenhouse gas emissions, um, global greenhouse gas emissions coming from agriculture, about half of that is coming from animal agriculture. So our high dependent dependency on an industrial form of meat production is contributing significantly to greenhouse gas emissions. And oh, bad news folks. Uh, as many of you are tracking this, uh, we have a new administration who's taking the emergency break off of our ability to actually manage greenhouse gas emissions. We have a climate change denying administration. They are not interested in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and are trying to get the United States out of the, the Paris Climate Accord. That does not bode well for managing climate change under the time frame that we've, uh, we have to operate in. At the same time, we, ha we have an incredibly productive agricultural sector, but the food system is broken in fundamentally other ways. So we have high levels of productivity. It's very energy intensive, but we still have a huge number of people in the United States who are food insecure. So about 15%, the, the number varies uh, quite little between years, uh, somewhere between 13 to 15% of the total US population has a difficult time gaining access to sufficient amounts of food to live a normal, healthy, productive life. That's a broken food system. If you look here locally, uh, I'm gonna just skip over this. If we look locally, not only do we see high rates of food insecurity in the native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander population, we also see very high rates of chronic illness. All of these things are diet related. Many of these things, as, as m most of you know, these health conditions are something that was socially constructed. This is something that is an artifact of colonial occupation and fundamental dislocation of the native Hawaiian people from their traditional livelihoods and marginalization economically so that people don't have access to high quality foods. This is something that we discuss in great detail in our program at West Oahu. This is a recent study I did of our own population, student population at West Oahu attempting to illustrate to the extent we have a food insecure population at the University of Hawaii. So we're seeing that of our student body, we have about 40% of our students reporting food insecurity in the last 12 months. So dealing with issues of food and agriculture are important environmentally and socially. It's difficult for young people to perform well if they're food insecure uh, while they're trying to get themselves to college. Drawing upon traditional agriculture, we know that traditional agricultural systems, they shared many things in common. So we learned today about some of the traditional practices of the lo'i. If you look around agricultural systems anywhere in the world, you see a similar set of agronomic or traditional ecological practices that are being used. So we can learn quite a bit from these traditional ecological practices and they have important adaptation and mitigation uh, potential for how we manage our food and farming systems in the future. So if you look at all forms of traditional agriculture, they're managed with high levels of biological diversity and space and time, the cycling of organic matter as we learned today in the Lo'i, all of those things contribute significantly to the sequestration of carbon, the cycling of nutrients, that are necessary for supporting plant growth and reduced ecological impacts. So I'm just going to keep moving along. So this is where I, traditional agriculture and Western science, I think, meet up quite nicely and it has implications for the type of food and agricultural system that we could develop here in Hawaii. So my, my research looks at the role of biological diversity in farming systems and what kind of ecological impacts does that have? And so this is a recent uh, summary of about 40 years of farming systems research looking comparatively at conventional and organic farming systems. So there's been a lot of natural science researchers who've been interested in this question is, do conventional farming systems create negative environmental externalities? And do organic farming systems perform better in terms of preserving environmental quality and human health? So if you look at these two um, when they're amoeba diagrams or petal diagrams, you look at the organic side and you see the length of the stave, the length of the petal, 
as an indicator backed by many meta-analyses and long-term studies showing a much higher level of environmental and social performance. So what I'm getting at here is now we have about 40 to 50 years of accumulated scientific information substantiating that these alternatively managed farming systems outperform conventional farming systems, as many would expect, across nearly every single environmental and social and economic performance metric. That's important for the type of food and agricultural system that we might want to develop here in Hawaii. And this is happening in a certain economic and political context. This is some of the other research that I do is looking at kind of the political economy of agricultural funding. So this shows this big gray bubble here is $160 billion, approximately the entire US Department of Agriculture budget. This set of little green dots is the amount of research and development dollars that goes into studying traditional ecologically based and organic farming system, a minuscule fraction. So despite this overwhelmingly positive performance of organic farming systems, it's entirely neglected in, at the US Department of Agriculture. And unfortunately, that's mm, unlikely to improve in the next four to eight years. So we're gonna have to rely on, of course, our own local knowledge in order to develop a type of food and agricultural system that truly serves our community. And there's conceptions of this, right? We, many people in this room have been working on this for decades, if not their entire life. So we can take control. We can take back control of our food and agricultural sector. We can develop a more resilient, ecologically sustainable, and equitable food and agricultural sector for Hawaii. And perhaps we're increasingly going to need to do so in order to manage our food security under the, in the context of climate change. But here are some of the obstacles. So in addition to looking at some of the biophysical science aspects of food and agricultural systems, I've been looking at what are the obstacles to meaningful food system change here in Hawaii. And these are some of the things that anecdotally in conversations with many professionals and farmers, these are the things that I've found to be uh, shared issues that we face in terms of changing the food and agricultural system of Hawaii. High cost of production. We're importing everything here into Hawaii. So everything that the farmers need in order to produce is very expensive because it's being shipped in from the outside, right? Raises cost of production, and there's very small land base here in Hawaii. They're competing, local farmers are competing with farmers who are growing 25,000 acre in scale farming operations in, in the Central Valley and uh, the coastal areas of California. So that places local agriculture at a competitive disadvantage. Prohibitions on housing on farmland. How many of you are aware of that one, right? That's been a long time issue. So if individuals cannot live on the land in which they farm, then that again raises their cost of production, increases the likelihood of theft on their farm. They're not in close connection with the land in which they want to work. Uh, so gaining access to secure, affordable land is critical. And adequate agriculture and food processing infrastructure. So that has to do with the fact that we've existed within a plantation agricultural economy for 150 plus years, and there has been no diversified agricultural sector uh, developed. And so many farmers who want to participate in local agriculture are finding that they need food processing infrastructure that doesn't exist. There's no basic infrastructure for producing diversified crops here in Hawaii, or it's in incredibly limited. It, uh, this, is, this is coming down the pike soon, and that is a food safety regulations from the federal government. That's going to impact farmers because they're gonna need to process all of their food in specific certified types of food processing facilities that are very expensive. So we may have economically viable farmers who once they are required to meet these food safety standards, they're not going to be able to do so because they're not, they don't have access to these commercial kitchens and so forth in order to produce that. And it, it's very expensive to create a FISMA certified commercial kitchen. Last couple of things. It's difficult for farmers, especially in the context where farmers don't own the land in which they may be uh, growing. If they don't own the land, they have no they have nothing that they can take to the bank 
to take out a loan on. So farmers are placed at a disadvantage in terms of access to capital. And then some of the soft skills, people lacking basic business planning skills, the ability to actually think through the scaling of production to meet the market demands that are in fact here, but are currently being uh, occupied by growers from the mainland. Okay, and then of course, negative perceptions of careers in agriculture coming out of a plantation, 150 years of plantation agriculture, many people have a very negative perception of, of agriculture. And our job, I believe, is to try to tackle some of these problems, and I think there is a role of technology uh, in addressing some of them, um, but also educating and training new generations of people to think about agriculture in a new way.